Welcome back to the Sports Talks Podcast. I'm Dr. Ashley Bassett. And I'm Dr. Katherine Logan. On each episode, we chat about the most recent developments in sports medicine with experts from around the country. In this episode, we're going to continue our discussion with Dr. Brian Lau and focus on bone restoration options for the surgical treatment of shoulder instability, and then wrap up with a discussion of return to play. Our conversation picks back up with a discussion of surgical treatment options for more significant glenoid bone loss. There is a 2021 Yellow Journal article entitled Diagnosis and Management of Traumatic Anterior Instability that nicely outlines the treatment algorithm based on the percentage of glenoid bone loss, as well as the presence and severity of hill sacs lesions. Then, from the April issue of AJSM this year, we discussed a study performed by our guest, Dr. Lau, and his team at Duke titled Distal Clavicle Autograph versus Traditional and Congruent Arc Ladder J Procedures. This laboratory analysis compared five different configurations of two local autograph options, the coracoid and the distal clavicle, using both 3D CT and 3D MRI. They looked at how much glenoid surface area was augmented, which is important to address the glenoid bone loss, and the amount of glenoid apposition provided, bone to bone contact being important for graft healing. And then we're going to finish up the conversation with my favorite topic. So we mm-hmm. have a return to play after shoulder stabilization surgery. The article that we reference is titled Criteria-Based Return to Sport Testing is Associated with Lower Recurrence Rates Following Arthroscopic Bank Cart Repair. So Albert Lin and his colleagues found that athletes who underwent this testing protocol to guide their clearance to return to sports had a lower rate of recurrent instability than those who cleared to return based just on time from surgery or time-based um, decision. All right, welcome back, Brian. We're going to shift our discussion now to management of more significant bone loss and how that affects the surgery um, that you recommend. So um, what is your threshold for anterior glenoid bone loss that you push towards a bony block procedure? Yeah, so I'll start thinking about it at 15, 15% really. So it's not, you know, not the, the traditional 20%. So at least I'll be thinking about it. And the reason I've, I've kind of got pushed over that we've been doing more of these distal tibial allografts and feel more comfortable with that you do less, you know, yeah. tissue breakdown, you can do it through a self scap. Um, and so that's when I would be thinking about depending on, you know, if they have a hill sacs associated with it, if they're more of a contact athlete, maybe that's be something I'd be thinking about doing more of. Um, and so that's kind of the threshold in terms of glenoid, um, but there's a lot of factors that go into obviously what their goals are and the hill sacs that comes involved, but uh, as a number of 15% when I start thinking about it, if it's over 20%, I'm definitely doing something bony. So. And then what about like patient factors? You kind of briefly mentioned it um, earlier, but like what patient factors push you towards bony um, block procedures? Yeah. So they, if they are like really young or adolescents, I'm generally not going to do that. But I'm going to try to do a soft tissue procedure, prevent from having uh, any screws or anything in there. Um, they tend to be older patients in their 20s um, who've had like recurrent dislocations and, um, you know, maybe have had a prior labor repair. Those are people definitely thinking about doing some bony as well. Um, and then if they're what to try and get back to. So if they're trying to get back to a contact athlete, you know, and they're still pretty really competitive, then I might be thinking about that. If they're less so, you know, um, more recreational and their playing careers have started ending a little bit more, then I'll probably be you know, steer myself away, you know, uh, from doing that bony procedure at first. So. Yeah. And yeah. Ashley, do you remember when we, we just found this interesting, there wasn't really a reason for it as much as just like culturally, like as far as a league, but when we, um, uh, talked to, uh, Mark Price, so from Mass yes. General series with the Patriots and he was saying NFL in general, like there wasn't as many, um, but mm-hmm. NHL, there was a ton. So like when you looked at the Bruins versus the Patriots, like it might be the same imaging, same, you know, they're obviously both in heavy contact sports, but just, you know, his sort of explanation was, you know, you have one guy in the NHL that's like, I'm really happy. This is what I had. And then, so their buddy's like, okay, I want that too. And then my friend had a lot of, you know what I mean? And then like, it was more of a cultural thing as opposed to like a clinical. So I don't know. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would say some of those elite athletes that come in and, of a plan they're like this is what i think we should do (laughs) (laughs) yeah i think it's a really good point catherine i think it goes back to like the surgeon factors too like that some surgeons are going to recommend like just I just saw a, a patient, not just saw, like within the last year that had a, uh, she was a chronic dislocator, but had a bony bank art fragment. And she had, came in with a CT scan. I was like, I think I can fix that. I think I can fix that bony bank art and do a remplissage at the same time. And she saw another patient who said, absolutely not. 
latter day because of like the chronic dislocating and things like that. So there's right there where she had gone with one person, she would have gotten a latter day. She went with me and we did a, a bony bank art fixation and rent massage, right? And so I think it's not only what they come in with, but it's also like who you meet, right? As your, as your right. surgeon too. So. Yeah. So then, so then I want to talk a little bit more about the um, graft options. You mentioned distal tibia allograft. We want to get to that in a little bit, but we want to talk a little bit more about the autograft options. So obviously there's mm -hmm. ladder shape with the coracoid, but there's also iliac crest and distal clavicle. Do you have any experience with either of those or what are your thoughts on those graphs? Well, I will, my go-to if I'm going to do autograft is going to be ladder J. Mm -hmm. um, I have not done iliac crest. Um, I've experimented in the lab and done a few of the distal clavicles. One of my partners, um, Dr. Anna Quenze, does a lot more of those distal clavicles. Um, mm -hmm. And um, so as a group, we have some experience with that. And uh, But my go-to still is really going to be a ladder J. I still believe in the sling effect. I might get into that point if I'm thinking yeah. that's something I need. Mm -hmm. um, and um, But yeah, those are kind of my experience with that, though. I don't know. What about you guys? Are you... Same. Total same. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm interested like in the distal mm -hmm. clavicle, I think there's, you know, some reasons why it's like interesting, but I just, you know, that wasn't something that was done by any of my mentors. So I think at this point, you know, I'd really have to be spending some time in the lab and kind of experimenting with it before I take it into the patient population. But i um, curious what your, you know, your colleague, like, do, what do they say is the reasons that they love it? They, you know, so their experience of, well, you know, I think people would do it because it's right there. Um, mm -hmm. You don't have use less risk than taking the you know cor uh, the coracoid and less risk of nerve injury. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a little bit more uh, flexible in terms of like getting good opposition to uh, like um, you know iliac crest for sure. Um, but one thing to note about it, and they'll to say too is that the bone there is a little bit weaker than say a coracoid. So you have to be a little more careful with the tissue handling and um, and stuff like that too. And so, uh, but. I think for like small, lower bone loss, like 15% or something like that, it's, it's a good option. I think if you get the bigger ones, I think as the paper just shows there, that it's not gonna really be good enough to accommodate for a big defect. Yeah. So. Yeah, Brian, I really liked the paper that, that was your paper where it looked at the different graphs and the different orientations and, um, you know, which which one had the greatest surface area and the greatest width. And so I, I what I like, I full disclosure, I don't do distal clavicle autograph, but I find it really appealing. And I would like to start because it's an autograph, which I think has a better healing capacity and it has um, articular cartilage, which latter J does not. Mm -hmm. Right. And so I I like that. Um, but as you pointed out, it doesn't have the sling effect, um, but you could place it you know, arthroscopically or, or not, you know, not disrupting the subscapularis and the lower risk of nerve injury. But my biggest concern is, is the limited bone uh, restoration that you have with it, right? It's small. And in a smaller patient, you're probably also limited by the size there. I know your paper showed the largest graph width but not in terms of surface area. Surface area was still ladder J. So I, I kind of agree. I think we're all saying the same thing. We all are doing ladder J, but we find the distal clavicle maybe appealing. We just need to hear a little bit more about it. Yeah. Yeah. So then a little bit more about the um, ladder J, um, what technique are you doing? Are you doing the traditional? Um, are you doing the congruent arc? Um, why do you choose one versus the other? I'm doing the standard traditional. Um, I just find that to get your screw purchase, it's, it's really hard with the congruent arc to get that screw, screw, screw purchase. Um, and so I, I want to make sure that that's going to heal well and that it's not going to pop off or anything like that. And so that's, I still do the standard um, technique. And you know, I, I do that, I think it's because I, I think about that sling effect and if someone's going to be really kind of stressing it, um, I want to make sure that purchase is really good and that good bone to bone healing, which is this study shows again, that standard had the best bone to bone opposition. Um, and I think the big thing for this data shows that the other thing is shown that you can plan preoperatively based on your imaging, that, that you can do that with a CD3, a 3D CT, you can also do it with 3D MRI, which was also in the study too. So. Um, I think that's also the value of the study it just showing that like, don't just jump to something, you can think about it and you can plan uh, ahead of time and seeing what, what orientation, what bone, uh, what bone autograph you might want to take. So, yeah. yeah. And with your um, 3D MRI, like, you know, are there other applications that you guys are seeing outside of shoulder instability? I don't know if that's something yeah. you've even thought about yet, but um, you know, where do yeah. you see that going? So, so not me personally, but one of my partners um, is doing it in the hip. And so we're doing a lot of 3D imaging of the hip for, yeah. um, you know, looking for bony lesions and the size of cam lesions and stuff like that. So he does that for all his hips. Okay. Um, 
we've thought about potentially doing it in the knee and looking if you're getting a looking for um, bone tunnels with uh, ACLs, if you're in the revision ACL setting, something like that. Um, that's still kind of in the very infancy of that, but that's one of the thoughts as well. So. Do you do hip? I don't do hip. Neither do we. Yeah. <laughs> I don't do hip. But honestly, bless the people who do because. <laughs> Someone has to do it. Thank you. They do it for us. So. Someone has to do it. <laughs> it's not going to be the three of us. <laughs> we've had, we won't name drop, but we've had a couple of people being like, oh, we'd love to come on the show and talk about hip. And we're like, but we don't know about it. Like, exactly. <laughs> we're going to have to study in order to <laughs> do that. Oh, man. We also, will, we'll, we'll do it someday and we'll have somebody and we'll study really hard before. And before. <laughs> we got it. <laughs> so Awesome. And then I'm curious to hear for your latter day, are you doing them arthroscopically? Are you doing them open? Would you think I'm you're going to do them arthroscopically in the future if you don't already? Yeah, I'm doing the latter days open. Okay. I don't think I'll be doing arthroscopically because I just, I just want to make sure yeah. I've seen everything well, gain that good, you know, make sure I'm protecting the nerves, all that kind of stuff. I think I've seen the technique and I think it's really super fancy, but um, yeah. I just want to make sure that I'm doing it safely. Um, Same. Yeah, and same because, for you, Catherine. Yeah. Not same. Yeah. You don't do it open. I mean, you don't do it arthroscopically, do you, Ashley? No, I wish I was that fancy. No way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I agree. And I also like closing the capsule with that the CA ligament and, you know, and just really, as you say, getting that opposition and getting that screw purchase. And I mean, I also think sometimes these videos make it seem super, you know, super easy to just yeah. get that right in there. And I think it's a super fuss. So I think yeah. open really works well. I, I agree. I'm, I'm doing open. I, I don't see myself moving towards arthroscopic. Yeah. yeah. It seems like a lot for a little, you know, yeah. like little yeah. advantage. Like, I, I don't know. Yeah, I think another thing that's steering me from it is I'm getting, we're doing a lot more of these distal tibia allografts. So if it's truly a big bone block issue, yeah. doing that arthroscopic, it's actually, in, in, I don't know, I haven't done it in beach chair, but in lateral, it's it's very, very easy, I would say. If you if you were very comfortable doing lateral position yeah. and you do a lot of instability, the learning curve to do a distal tibia allograft with that is actually not that steep, I would say, okay. if, you're, if you're comfortable doing a, sh a lateral shoulder instability. So. Yeah, talk a little bit about that. I'd yeah. love to hear about it. So yeah, like, so I mean, you I, do everything, you prepare everything the same. Um, you prepare everything the same you would you actually, um, you're going to do a little bit more burring on the front to kind of make that more of a flat surface. Mm -hmm. And then all the work on the back table, if you do any kind of allograft, it's not too different from that. You make some measurements, you use a saw, a freehand cut to get the size and the diameter you want. And then the key is using the, um, uh, oh crap, what's the Ivan Wong's um, portal in the front. Um, oh, I know what you're talking part. about. Uh, what's the name of it again? Name I remember the, names of nothing. Name of the town that he's from. He's gonna he's gonna kill me for not saying it. Oh, no. Is that the one that looks like it's coming from the chest? It that does. it's like it's, it's yeah, chest. it looks like you're you're like coming. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's um, stressful. <laughs> you gotta make sure you're you're, you're um, draped out further and um, yeah. lines so you have, don't get that trouble. But you basically come from your posterior portal, you come just over the subscap and push the subscap down for a switching stick and poke through and do it like you make a portal from outside in. Mm -hmm. And that avoids you from injuring that subscap. And then the one fancy part of it is getting that graph through that that port that big portal. Yeah. But after that, it's it's not too hard. It's all done arthroscopically. You see everything, um, and you get a really good opposition. You can see it really well. You can see it squeeze down better than you can for a ladder J, just because you're like your camera's like staring right at it. Um, and so um, we've gotten very comfortable with doing that. And so if if it's mo more of a bone loss issue and less of a capsular issue, that's something that um, um, getting very comfortable with and doing a lot more up here at Duke. Yeah. So. Thanks. How do you fixate the graft um, if you're doing it arthroscopically, I guess, versus still open? Still through a screw. Still through a oh, screw. still with so a screw. Okay, so not suspensory. Guide. There's a guide that you put in there and um, that allows you to your trajectory for a screw. Interesting you mentioned, you know, the buttons. You know, mm -hmm. uh, Ivan Wong did a study where he looked at screws versus buttons for his technique that took up this out. Taylor um, allograft and um, he of uh, tibia, that's what Taylor, but just mm -hmm. tibia allograft. And uh, he found that there was a little bit more, you know, um, resorption and stuff, and it wasn't quite as, as good fixation, not yet, at least with the current technology we have for buttons um, and suspensory stuff. So he's, he's getting back to more screws, and I still use screws. I have not experimented with the, the buttons um, yet. So we'll see. Yeah. The, um, 
uh, Halifax. Halifax. Oh, yes. that's what it is. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but so I was actually thinking of one of the surgeons that Ashley and I worked with, who we did a lot of our shoulder instability work with. There was one, um, uh, one case that we we're set up to do um, a tibial allograft, and um, the basically the young guy got blocked. Where, and then, okay, you know, going back, checking on the graft and all that sort of stuff and realized it was left in somebody's office all weekend, got delivered on a Friday, stayed in like the FedEx shipping, whatever. No. Oh, <laughs> no, man. And it was like Monday morning and it was <sighs> like, oh. <laughs> oh yeah. That's when you're like, give me that clavicle. Just yeah, <laughs> take your clavicle. <laughs> it's just, it's what you got. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh man, that's. Yeah. That's infuriating. Wow. Yeah. yeah, very, very. We actually uh, just canceled and rescheduled. But, yeah, um, that makes sense. Block, so it's a big bummer. Yeah. Um, anyhow, uh, but Halifax. So yeah, there it is. Um, okay, so um, we talked a little bit. Um, a Ashley, anything else you want to touch on with like allograft options? Well, yes, I did want to ask, I don't know if you had heard about this, at AOSSM, they were presenting on bone graft options and they presented on the distal radius allograft for yeah. um, bone restoration. They said it's really similar in terms of availability and cost to the distal tibia and it has perhaps a better curvature. Have you heard of this being used? Is anyone using it at your institution? What are your thoughts about it? Yeah, so I have heard of it. I know the data is still very preliminary. Um, very no, preliminary. No one, at, no one, at, no one at, at Duke is doing that right now. Um, but I've heard of it. I'm intrigued, but I just feel like um, this, the hand is pretty important for people. If you're going to take some, I mean, I don't think, it's, is it articular that they take? I don't yeah, they take articular. Yeah. Oh, it's aloe. I'm sorry. Aloe graph, not say, auto. Okay. Yes. <laughs> people wouldn't like that. Yeah. So it's, it's aloe. Yeah. But, yeah. Um, no, I mean, we haven't, no one's done it, but I think that's interesting. I, I think that you know, is there a benefit, you know, being closer, you know, they talk about the further you are from, you know, the heart and central organs that the yeah. donor sites mm. are it's good. Um, and so that's probably, that could potentially be better. Maybe it's, you know, huh. but um, I have not experimented with that. And I, I can't say I know enough about it to, to yeah. say how that's done, but. Same. I, I just heard of it. Yeah. It, that was also the first time I had heard about it as well, too. And I found it's interesting. They did like the bone mineral um, density evaluation because they thought because it's a non weight bearing joint that it wouldn't be as dense as the distal tibia. And they found that bone quality was pretty equivalent in terms of fixation strength. So it seems really appealing. But then someone did ask, oh, is it more available? Because distal tibias are hard to find. And they said, no. And is it a lower <laughs> cost? No. So it's it's very similar in terms of the difficulty to get compared to distal tibia. But it, it is appealing. I'm excited to see what other studies yeah. come out about it. Yeah. One sure. of the things that we're trying to do at Duke right now, and I maybe mean, I should be saying because it's very early, but we're trying to 3D print these biologically. Mm -hmm. 3D print them. Wow, that's so cool. So, very cool. Um, using some Wait. of the, the data that we have from our MRI sequences, because you're, can you, one, can you make the measurements accurately, but then also using that same data to potentially 3D print. Um, yeah. some, Oh, Forgive my possibly, this may be a stupid question. Like what material are you using to 3D yeah. print this? So it's going to be biological material. So wow. um, the idea is that it's going to integrate, integrate. It's based off some of the work that one of my colleagues in foot and ankle are doing in, for foot and ankle, but and also on the knee where they're trying to make like, um, and so we're trying to see if it can be used in a shoulder as well. Yeah. So. Wow. Very cool. Yeah, well, that's awesome. You'll have to come back and tell us all about it if it goes. Yeah, I think it's probably still a couple of years away, honestly. Yeah, but, I'm sure yeah. that'll be. <laughs> yeah, that'll be a big IRB. <laughs> yeah, I bet. <laughs> but that'll be good. Um, so mm -hmm. why don't we then fast forward a little bit um, to the thing that we'll end up closing with, which is basically rehab return to play. Mm -hmm. So. Um, once, you know, they obviously have their initial stabilization period, we kind of take them through, um, or I should say a mobilization period, and then, you know, early motion, you know, doing all their strengthening and stuff as they get back to return to sport. So our final paper that um, we're discussing is criteria-based return to sport protocol. So we kind of touched on this earlier in the first episode where we can't just look at time, we have to look at criteria. So similar to ACL testing to guide it. So these same um, functional tests that you mentioned with return to sport in the non-operative, are these similar to what you're doing in the post-operative? They are, they are. So it's gonna be the same battery. 
um, that we do in the operative patients as well. And we start that at four months. Okay. So we start doing it at four months and then we, um, you know, we redo it every two months until they, you know, pass or once they get past eight months to a, you know, a year, it starts being like, okay, maybe this is, you know, we should yeah. push a little more and get you going. But, um, so, but the earliest we start doing is at four months. Okay. Right. And if they pass at four months, do you clear them to go back in at four? Let's say like a bank art. Uh, we'll talk about the latter J in a little bit, but arthroscopic bank art, if they clear it four months, would you clear them to go back into contact? Or you wait I for would, six? I would, if, if, their, if their test results show really well and it's arthroscopic label, I mean, mm -hmm. um, it's pretty straightforward. And again, it goes back to kind of what their sport is going back to, but mm -hmm. generally, yeah, I would. I would feel comfortable with the test results that they're showing. I would. Yeah. Yeah. It's you know, I do think there's a lot of value because I'm sure, I mean, my guess would be that it'd be really rare to find someone who passes everything at four months. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, maybe the occasional person does, but, you know, I also tell people like, and remind them there's that difference between return to sport and return to performance. So, you know, mm -hmm. just because maybe at four months you're saying, yep, you can get into practice and doing those skills and whatever, it doesn't mean that you're going to be where you're at you know, you're going to be say lacrosse athlete shooting with the same sort of, um, velocity, power, speed, you know, all this sort of stuff, like all your metrics are probably going to be down. So just because I'm letting you do some skills now, doesn't mean you're actually like, you know, full contact, full performance, you're making the starting lineup. That's a really, really good point. Because I think people forget that like, oh, I'm clear. I'm going to run out, run out in the tunnel and be a, just as yeah. I was before, I was like, nope, mm -hmm. not quite. You know, you got a lot, still a lot of rehab to get back for that. So, yeah, absolutely. The example, like I always give people, like just so they can kind of wrap their mind around it, is like, you know, if today was the day I was clearing you to run, and your goal was to run a marathon, like no way in your mind would you be like, oh, tomorrow I'll do 18. You know what I mean? Like you would yeah. just be like, okay, let me set up a plan. You know, it's like no different. You'd be like, what are the steps for me to get to that marathon? You know, it's like, what are the steps for me to get to full contact play? Like I have to start with my individual skills. Then I have skills with people I trust, um, you know, a teammate that I can, you know, sort of play with. And then I play with my team and then mm -hmm. I play against another team. You don't just, you know, get in there. Yeah, right. exactly. Absolutely. Awesome. So we talked about the testing and you said arthroscopic yeah. bank art, but now ladder J, is it still just based on the testing or do you get any imaging to determine that they're healed mm -hmm. and safe? So uh, we still, we definitely, we still do the tests in the same time points. So it's still going to be a four months, six months and two month intervals based on their test results. And I'm curious what you guys do, because I started off getting CT scans on my latter J's. And then I'm always like, I wish I didn't get that, you know, <laughs> you know, it never looks perfect. And then yeah. like, they feel great. Their test results are great. And you're like, now what do I do with this data? Um, mm -hmm. So I've been doing it less and less, um, yeah. but I'm curious what you guys are doing. I don't get a CT scan, you know, again, like, you know, and I think that's what we've heard from other surgeons as well, mm -hmm. is that, you know, generally early on, you start with getting a lot of imaging. And then over time, you're like, I'm not sure that's all very necessary to like, inform my decision. And then mm -hmm. am I putting them through extra radiation, extra, mm -hmm. you know, and for what? So I think, um, you know, speaking of like the NFL doc that we mentioned earlier, like, mm -hmm. you know, he wasn't doing that. And he was really looking at a lot of how they feel, what's their performance like, you know, do they have any apprehension type symptoms? Yep. Yeah. I completely agree. I'm, I'm not getting CT scans because again, I think, what am I going to do with that information? So I feel like when we get MRIs after um, osteochondral oligraph transplants, right? And I'm making sure that there is creeping migration, that there's healing before I'm beginning really intense impact. That that makes sense to me because if there's not, I'm going to hold them back from maybe running, you know, long distances and things like that. But with this, if there's a partial union and maybe the rest is fibrous and they have no apprehension and full strength and they pass this test, am I really going to hold them out for another month or two? I'm not. So I kind of, as you said, you look at it and you're like, well, I wish I hadn't gotten that, right? So if I'm not going to change my plan based on that, I, I don't, I do get um, an x-ray just to, just to check and evaluate and just make sure the hardware looks good and everything, but I'm, I'm not getting CT scans in these people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, know, I had one, you know, at some point that he basically had a trauma after his where like skateboarding and, you know, I wasn't totally happy with the x-ray and, you know, wanted to get, um, advanced imaging. And he was like, why I feel great. Like just wouldn't do it. Like, just like, yeah. you know, like 
I feel fine. Like, cause he ended up separating his, like he felt like he basically got hit by a car, um, skateboarding and he had, uh, like an AC separation at the time. And he was like, that's the only thing that bothers me. I feel great. I'm not doing it. Like, <laughs> <it's> like yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I think it would also be very hard to hold back someone like that. Like I don't think like, I feel yeah. great. My test results are great. And you're going to hold me that because like a third of it's not healed. It looks like right. not fully fully. You're going like, yeah. to yeah. 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 Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think awesome. it's always like everything. It's just multifactorial and you have to sort of put it all together. Yeah. Exactly. And that's why this return to play test is so good because it's not only, um, you mentioned the the WOSI scores that you look at and um, do you do any like psychological tests yeah, like that's, ACL? That's, uh, that's the shoulder instability RSI, return sport index. Oh, awesome. So we do look at that. That's part of the, the battery as well. You know, the number that, you know, it's out there is like 56 or something like that. If it's less mm -hmm. than that or more. Interestingly, if you're greater than 90, it actually can be higher risk because you're too confident in the shoulder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so yes. you know, we're still looking back at our data set now and trying to get hone in that more a little bit about what, what that number should be. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, we are having that as a component of it. Yeah. I think another thing that would be interesting, which we haven't done, is looking at kind of like kinesophobia um, and like that part of it, um, because that's a real thing, you know, people in terms of like, and I think we haven't really focused and thought about that as much, but in terms of any replated um, thinking, I think that's a big component, how confident you are, how, how scary are you in terms of having it happen again, so. Yeah, yeah. I think, oh, go ahead, Ashley. I was just gonna- No, I was just- ACLs, but. I, I, yes, I was, I, we're gonna say the same thing, are we, about the bear ACLs? Is that what you were gonna say? Because well, I was I gonna say that, go ahead. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like the ACL bear that they, um, they feel they have a psychological readiness to return to play way earlier than they should. And how that's like, you have to hold people back from that. So it's like, if you were to release people based on their psychological analysis for a procedure like that, you're going to increase their risk of re-injury. So I think, as you said, it's like, it's one facet, right? They may feel ready, but if they don't do well with the other scores, then you really have to educate them to not do something or else they're at a higher risk than the average person. Catherine, what were you going to say about our favorite topic? No, I was going to just talk about how can ACL phobia is like well documented in the ACL, you know, as one mm -hmm. of the risk factors of people having um, another injury or injuring their other side. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's, you know, um, Ashley knows I've recently sort of been working um, behind the scenes with this woman, Emily Perrin, who is, she's on the sports psychology side um, and also works with USA Lacrosse. And we're, um, you know, hopefully this fall, like launching our pilot study with at least my patients to start where we're sort of integrating at the same time, some sort of mental skills sort of training, um, as well as some of these like guided meditations. This is not me leading them, of course, but <laughs> <laughs> um, as sort of a pilot study to look at, you know, if we sort of put in some of these psychological sort of um, constructs and skills, does this change any of that? Um, than, you know, compared to without. So I think big interest area of mine, and I think with the shoulder, there's even less data. You know, I think I was so excited about this return to sports study and return to play testing for the shoulder because it's just so limited um, mm -hmm. in general. So I, I think there's a big need for, you know, adding in some of those um, return to sports psychological kind of metrics too. Yeah. And our, and our therapists want it too. So I was actually talking to some of our local therapists and we were actually trying to come up with a return to play test for bank art stabilization. They did a big literature search and we came up with a whole bunch. And then I was reading this paper. I was like, oh, someone is doing this, right? Like someone is going through and doing the same thing. And so it's really important because I just feel like we now know having more data leads to more educated decision making and making sure our athletes are safe and just deciding six months and full strength is, is probably not appropriate. So I'm excited to see what more comes out about this. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Catherine, do you have anything else to ask Brian before I dive into the fast five? No, we have five <laughs> fast questions for you, Brian, and then we'll release yeah. you. <laughs> All right, so Brian, in the OR, foot pedal or hand control? Foot pedal. Okay. Well, foot pedal for shaver, hand for um, you know Arthur Wand or. Oh. You know, Okay, so you're, yeah, yeah. Nice. Nice. yeah. nice. <laughs> um, what kind of shoes do you wear in the OR, right? I wear dance goes. Wow, old school yeah. medical school. Yeah. I like it. <laughs> I know, old school. <laughs> <laughs> what is your favorite OR lounge snack? Do you get good snacks at Duke? <laughs> 
Uh, well, they have some really good chocolate chip cookies that I always get at lunch. So that is nice. my second choice. So awesome. Okay, what music do you play in the OR? So I tend to let wherever the most junior trainee is pick the music. So, well, that's so nice awesome. of you. So. <laughs> wow, what if they pick like Nickelback or something? Do you let them keep doing it? <laughs> there was one time we were doing like, a, it was a big day. We had like multi legs of letter J's and this was to be us. It was like a big, big day. Yeah. And he wanted to list the, the mess he wanted to list the country all day. And I was like, we're gonna do that for one case. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. Did we... I don't know about you, Catherine. I have like, it depends on the day. So like if I'm having like a revision ACL day, it's like hip hop barbecue. That's yeah. the only thing that can go on. <laughs> and if it's like easy cuffs and stuff, it's like summer hits of the 2010s is like on, you know, it depends <laughs> on the day. I, I don't know. And the vibe. <laughs> I would say so my preference is generally, I like a little bit more like uh, stuff that not everybody likes. Like I would like more like metal, hard rock, like Metallica, kind of stuff like that. Whereas it's not lo beloved by all. So um, the crowd pleaser that most people like, so I just do that is hip hop barbecue. Mm -hmm. um, it's good. Mm -hmm. But um, there's something I was gonna say. Oh, Nickelback, really quick. Oh um, gosh. <laughs> There's this town, I don't know if they still do it, in Canada and maybe in like Prince Edward Island, like it's pretty rural, um, where when you get pulled over uh, for a DUI, they drive you around in the car um, and make you listen to the entire Nickelback CD. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good deterrent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, okay, awesome. go ahead. All right, so fifth question, because I usually say our last, but it's not, because yeah. we'll have that, that sixth one. So what's your favorite surgery? My favorite surgery right now? Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Probably, I would say, like, a, a nice arthroscopic labral repair plus yeah, spinal well, surgery. Satisfying. I really enjoy that. It's just really satisfying to get that nice bumper in there. Yeah. Obviously, I, I enjoy a lot of different surgeries, because I, I do shoulder, knee, and ankle stuff. But, um, but if I had to pick one that I like the most right now, I'd probably shoulder instability. Yeah. Nice. All right, then the last question, it doesn't have to be um, medical at all. Um, pose a question for Dr. Preventure. Um, geez, <laughs> well, let's see. Um, if I had to do one medical, let's see, I'll do one medical, one non-medical. Okay. So let's see, um, medical, he's talking about return to sports. So I guess, When is he considering repairs or if he does repairs for any of the, any of the ligaments that he might be thinking from what legs, or is he always okay. wanting reconstruction? Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like um, it. And then non-medical, I think one. So, uh, what's he thinking about the Patriots now? <laughs> <laughs> That's, a good one. That's a good one. And he has to answer. <laughs> I love it. All right. Yes. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Brian. This was yeah. awesome. Well, no, I really Thank appreciate it. It was great. So. Yeah. yeah, this is a lot of fun. Thank you for joining us. And uh, and we uh, we look forward to hearing about the results of that, that study, the OASIS study that you're doing. We look forward to seeing that. Yeah, that was great. Well, thanks for having me. It was, it was a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Sports Docs. We hope you enjoyed our conversation today as much as we did. Make sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts to stay up to date on all things sports medicine. You can also check us out on YouTube as well. If you like what you hear, please consider leaving us a review and subscribing. You can also reach us by email at thesportsdocspod at gmail.com or find us on Instagram at thesportsdocspod or Twitter at thesportsdocpod. We love your feedback. Stay fit, friends.